All right, welcome back to One Bills Live here on a Friday. Chris Brown, Steve Tasker with you, and it is time to bring in our weekly guest for this time slot. And Greg Cosell's weekly segment is presented by Scott Lawnyard, an official commercial site work partner of the Buffalo Bills. It is NFL film senior producer Greg Cosell joining us, also co-host of ESPN's NFL Matchup Show. How are we doing this week, Greg? The better question is, how are you guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a fair one to flip around on us. We're surviving. It's as we tell everybody, it's just snow. Like you can, you move it and you move on. That's kind of how it goes. I mean, once you get five and six feet, then you have to pull out the roof rake and start pulling snow off your roof. So it doesn't cave in. But I don't even know what five or six feet of snow means. Chris. So <laughs> I, I, that's, that's way beyond my comprehension. Uh, and I'm not, and you know, growing, I grew up in New York and now obviously I'm outside of Philadelphia. So sure we get snow, but not a ton. And I'm not a big fan. Like to me, five inches of snow is a lot of snow. I, I guess yeah. where you are right now, wouldn't be the best place for me. No, yeah, I don't, it's, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. It's uh yeah, it's an acquired taste. I'll put it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Greg, let's begin here because I I noticed well, I watched I watched the Browns game against Miami last week, and they come out and they're very efficient on offense. That first drive, it's like a four or five play scoring drive. Brissett hit is like six for his first six passes. They come out on the second drive, they're rolling, and then Nick Chubb fumbles the football. They never find the rhythm again the rest of the game. Yeah. Well, I, that was just bizarre to me that there was such a flip of the switch and they could never get it back again. Yeah, you know, I, when I watch the Browns offense, Brownie, I there are times I feel, as you said, they're very efficient. Um, they're not a big play offense. They don't hit a lot of big plays. Obviously, on that first drive early, uh, it was one of their first plays, I think. They hit the stutter go to Donovan Peoples-Jones. Yes. Um but they don't hit a lot of big plays in the pass game. Um, although Brissett is capable of big throws, uh, you know, but it's an odd thing that they, they really don't hit a lot of big plays. The other thing that strikes me is very odd about them is they do not feature play action as much as you would think, given their run game. You know, when you look at their play action numbers, which I'm sure you have, Compared to the rest of the league and other quarterbacks in the league, they're nowhere near the top of the league in running play action. Mm. And you would think, given not only the strength of their run game, but the fact that they play with two tight ends and three tight ends and a fullback at times, because all that makes the defense line up in, in specific ways. It's not just the actual action itself, but you know how the defense will line up when you line up with two tight ends or three tight ends or a fullback. And yet they're not a big play action team in terms of volume, you know, number of plays in which they run play action. Little idea of, about, you know, why they're so effective in one part of their offense can't get it going in another, you know, Jacoby Brissett is, you know, kind of a stand in for Deshaun yeah. Watson. But give us an personality of their run game. Zone schemes, is it pin and pull, uh, or do they it's, do it all? It's it's both, Steve, because they have a um, – their their guards, Joel Batonio and Wyatt Teller. You guys are familiar with Wyatt, Wyatt Teller. I believe mm -hmm. Buffalo sure. drafted him, did they not, out of Virginia they did, Tech? Yep. And uh, he got a chance to play in Buffalo, and I actually thought he played well, but obviously he moved on to Cleveland. He's become, Steve, one of the best pulling guards in the league. So they like to run gap scheme, and he's more often than not the puller, and he's really good kicking out. You know, when you run gap scheme, as you know, the the puller usually kicks out the uh, the widest defender on the line of scrimmage, and then if there's a second guy who pulls, we call him the wrapper, and he goes inside the puller, and he gets the next guy that shows. But uh, but Wyatt Teller is really really good at pulling and kicking out the widest defender on the uh, de on the defensive line. So they run gap scheme because he's really good at it. But they still run zone a lot as well. So so they really have a multiple run game. Greg, I did notice a fair amount of twelve personnel from them. It's their oh. second most popular yep. personnel grouping behind eleven. Yeah. My question to you is: all the defensive coaches that you've spoken to over the years when you have a team yes you have a main personnel grouping that's what your identity is essentially but when there is such a heavy secondary personnel grouping in comparison to maybe some of the other things they might turn to over the course of a season is it is it a matter is it safe to say 
we know what the Browns are going to do. Now we just have to find a way to effectively defend it. I'm not saying that they could come up with a wrinkle. They could, but sure. after, after 10 weeks, this is pretty much who they are now. They're an 11 or a 12 personnel team most of the time, it seems. Well, you know, one thing I've learned from talking to coaches, and, and I've, uh, this is a question I like to ask for the, because when I watch tape and I see a play and I say, wow, that is a perfect play against that coverage. You know, and and so I think to myself, does a team know what they're getting? Is is that do they anticipate based on film study that, you know, 85 percent of the time they're going to get that that coverage or whatever you're talking about, Brownie? So I think that in the NFL, for the most part, coaches know what they're going to get to a large extent. So let's say it's first and 10 and you line up in 12 personnel. You know if the other team is in base defense, of course, this probably won't apply to Buffalo, but you you know, just to make the point, um, <laughs> yeah. if the other team's in base defense, that they're probably going to be in one or or of two different coverages because that's what they play on first and ten in their base defense. Steve, I think you would probably echo this based on your years in the league. You know, you know in certain situations, you're not getting one of 25 different things, you're getting one of two or three different things. Right. That's, That's the right. way it works, you know, and so you get a feel for a team and maybe you work through that, in, you know, with your first series, your second series. And then the guys upstairs tell the, you know, the play caller, if he's on, you know, let's say, let's say he's on the field, say, hey, look, here's what we're getting on first and 10. And then you kind of know and then you call plays that reflect what you have learned and what, you know, it just sort of. It, it re it kind of reevaluates what you knew going in, but you just want to make sure that's what you're getting. How has Jacoby played for Cleveland? And we've seen him play for Indianapolis. Yep. We've seen him play for the Patriots. We've seen him play teams playing for Cleveland. Is he better? Are they working with him? Is he, um, but they've got in him and you can tell they're calling plays for Jacoby. What, what's he playing like? You know, Jacoby Brissett to me has always been fascinating, Steve, because I watched him coming out of NC state. And there were times with his size and his strength that I said to myself, wow, this guy reminds me of Ben Roethlisberger. Um, and he was, I guess, a second or third round pick of New England. And from what I've heard from people, he's an unbelievable kid. You know, he's one of those guys. Um, and I guess I thought he'd be a better pro quarterback. You know, you can line up and play with Jacoby Brissett. He's not going to hurt you. He's not going to kill you. It's not like, oh, my God, we got to put him in. You know, you can line up and play and he can execute your offense. And all these years, and you know, I haven't studied him in the, in the detail. I've studied other quarterbacks, Steve, but there's something missing that that prevents him from being more than what he is now, which is a perfectly fine guy to play, you know, to put out there and play if you've got enough team, um, you know. And every once in a while, he makes throws. He made a throw this past week, Brownie. You probably saw it, and I think it was to Donovan Peoples Jones on a third down where he stuck it into an incredibly tight window. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, that's one of those throws where, you know, if Josh Allen made that throw, we'd go, wow, that is just an unbelievable throw by Josh, you know, and, and it was Jacoby. So no one says a word, but it was, a, you know, a really big time tight window throw against zone coverage. And he does that every once in a while and he's mobile and he can move and make some plays with his legs, but it just never has become more than that, you know? So he's, and that's why he's viewed as a guy you play until you find someone better. Yeah, two Dolphins defenders actually crashed into one another. On That's that right. Pass. It was crazy. Um, what do we make of the Browns' defense overall? And then what did Miami do to completely take Miles Garrett yeah. out of the game? I mean, he was not a factor. At I know Tua gets it out fast, so it's hard for even the premier pass rushers to get to him in the first place. But did they do anything else besides the quick rhythm passing game well, that they're now known for? I mean, look, that's a major part of it, but they also have one of the best left tackles in the league in Taron Armstead. And and I made it a point to watch the one-on-ones when they when it was one-on-one, and, and he truly had to block him for longer than, let's say, 1.5 seconds. You yeah. know, because when the ball comes out in that three-step drop timing, the ball's out in 1.5 seconds. A track star couldn't get there, you know, to, to, to hit two in, it, when that happens. But I thought Armstead did an unbelievably good job, but he would be a top three or four left tackle in this league. So, you know, you're fortunate. That was a major move Miami made in the offseason that was overlooked because of Tyreek Hill. Um, and obviously the coaching change was, you know, relatively big news. Yeah. But um, I think that's that's what Miami's offense is. 
you know, everything is quick rhythm. The ball comes out, you know, we'll, we'll see what, what Buffalo does because uh, look, you know, I'm just, I'm just talking tape study, but Deion Dawkins is not at that level of left tackle that Taron Armstead is. And, you know, if you start with deeper drops, you're going to have a potential concern there on that side that you may have to chip him. You may have to keep someone in to double him. You may have to do something specific if you want to take deeper drops and throw the ball. So what do you think this game's going to look like? I mean, the, I was going to ask you as well, you watched the Bills over the last couple of weeks. Oh, um, sure. So the, and I, I maintain, we talked about this last week. I maintain there's a lot of teams that would have lost the way the Jets played them. Well, yeah. I got to tell you, uh, I, I said this on a couple of other shows this week because I got tired. You know, I, everything I say, you guys know, is based on film study. I don't make bold, controversial statements, okay? I just don't do that because I don't even know what that means. But I just sit here and watch tape all day, and I'm a little nuts in, in terms of how much I watch and how I go about, you know, trying to do this. And I heard a lot of people talk earlier this week about the Bills having a Josh Allen problem. And you've probably heard all that, too. And I watched that game really carefully because I was very curious, the one against the Vikings. And I got to tell you, I don't know what you guys thought. I thought Josh Allen played really well. Now, obviously, things have to be cleaned up. I'm not going to sit here and defend red zone interceptions and, and some of the poor throws and decisions he's made over the last two or three weeks. But I would say those are isolated plays, be, you know, and again, do they have to be cleaned up? Absolutely. You know, like I said, indefensible, but overall, I, I thought he played really well against Minnesota. I, you know, I didn't think that he was struggling. I didn't think he played poorly. Uh, you know, I thought he played well. Now he explained both those interceptions and you can take it for what it's worth, but you know, I think the Bills, they still need to run the ball more and they still need to run the ball in, in certain situations. I think you guys would both agree when they were up big late third quarter and early fourth quarter, Steve, you know this, you have to be able to line up and run the ball. Even if you don't get first downs, you're eating clock. You're eating. Cl they had one drive. It might have been in the fourth quarter, Brownie, when they were ahead where they came out and they threw it three times in a row and then they punted. And yep. I think, what, 30 seconds went off the clock? You know, I, I I think in those situations, and again, I don't rip, this is not a rip on the coaches. I don't do that. I'm just sitting here watching the game and thinking, you know, wow, you're up by whatever it is. And it's the fourth quarter. And, you know, I think it's time to hand it off. That's kind of the way I right. felt watching it. Um, one other thing about the Browns defense, Greg, you know, sometimes we see this, but if you look at their defensive statistics, two of their three leading tacklers are their safeties. Yeah. Del Delpit and Johnson. Yeah. I can't imagine that is what their defensive staff wants to see in the stat no. column. Their two safeties as two of their three leading tat. That is an issue. What, what do you think is behind that? What is causing or keeping their front seven from making more plays? Well, I think they've really struggled at the defensive tackle position mm -hmm. this year. And I think they've also had injuries at linebacker. Anthony Walker's out for the year. He's a right. really good player. Um, um, the Notre Dame kid is out too. Uh, we'll we'll too Cora Cora Moore, yeah. uh, he's been out for quite a while. So, you know, they're playing with basically some backup linebackers. Uh, so I think that's been a little bit of an issue. Um, you know, I, that's one reason they traded for Deion Jones, who quite frankly is not the player he was two or three years ago. So they're basically playing with Jones, Taki Taki, um, you know, but inside, you know, they started to play a lot of rookies. They're playing Alex Wright, a player I actually really liked on tape coming out of a smaller school. They're playing Isaiah Thomas now, an Oklahoma kid. I think they're trying to find people to play. We know how good Garrett is. Um, you know, Clowney's back. But Clowney, Clowney to me, is an up-and-down player. I, I don't think Clowney is a great player. I think Clowney is a splash player based on tape study. So they've had some issues, um, you know, and, and they've really had a hard time stopping the run inside. And I think, you know, what's happened is their, their safeties have to get involved. They started to play a lot of big nickel where they play three safeties as opposed to three line, three linebackers. You know, we'll see if they do that. They could end up against the Bills being in nickel the whole game. And their nickel has had Newsom moving inside um, with Ward and the rookie Emerson on the outside. And I think if uh, you go after Emerson, I think you got to go after Emerson if that's the case. And is, is there any uh, – philosophy that you would think needs to take place for the bills in this game obviously josh and and the passing 
be the centerpiece, but is there a shift or something you'd like to see them explore that they have? Well, Ad, I mean, we've talked about, you know, the, the screen game is non-existent, yeah. the, the short – and they started out the season. They yeah. were very efficient. They didn't go down the field. They were doing the release passes, very, you know, shorter passing game. And then, you know, I think since the game when they snapped a couple of huge plays off, all of a sudden they stopped – using the possession passing game as a weapon or at least yeah, as much as they do. you know again it comes down to philosophy and everybody has a different philosophy and there's no right or wrong one thing you don't i'm just saying what you don't see very often with the bills passing game is you don't see a lot of what, what i would call combination routes i think steve there's a lot of individual isolation routes where they expect guys essentially to win you know and obviously Diggs is one of the best receivers in the league he can win you know, I'm not sure all the other guys can win with that kind of needed consistency. So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, maybe what I'd like to see and Ken Dorsey, if he's listening, might tell me I'm an idiot. Maybe I am. But I would like to see more, you know, things like stack, bunch, rub, picks, you know, things that help receivers and then help your quarterback because it defines reads and throws really quickly. Um, so, you know, those are the kinds of things, Steve, you don't see a lot with the Bills pass game. And it looks like Greg Newsom, Greg, is a question mark. He got into a collision in practice today. He's now listed oh. as questionable. He may go into concussion protocol. Uh, if he does, there's no way he's going to be ready in time for the no, game. No. There's no word on whether he's been put in the protocol yet. They're, they were evaluating him post-practice. Uh, so if he doesn't go, you already mentioned Emerson and how he would be the guy to pick on. Now you're talking about putting Greedy Williams on the field, too, and Nickel. So well, they also they've been playing green. This kid green, so he may. I don't know what they would do at that point. Yeah, because, AJ Green. Yeah, he he's when they've gone dime, he's been the fourth corner. Okay. So, uh, so I don't know if he becomes the third corner now. If indeed Newsom cannot go. Yeah, right. It'll be yeah. interesting. That's right. ahead, One of the other, the other the other things that we're talking about here is the shuffling around. Uh, what what effects do you see? When Tremaine Edmonds is not on the field, Greg Rousseau is going to. Yeah. Well, certainly every team is affected by really good players who, who aren't out there. Mike Jordan Poyer, uh, Greg Rousseau, and of right. course Tremaine Edmonds. That's right down the center of the Bills. For Rousseau. Yeah, and I think in this case the the run defense will obviously be critical um, because uh, you know who they're playing against. I mean, they're going to get a heavy dose of Nick Chubb, and and Chubb is. I mean, this is a really good back. You know, Chubb is Chubb has a body type that would suggest he'd be kind of a sustaining grinder, but he's really explosive. You know, he, he breaks tackles and is explosive and fast and can re-accelerate. You know, I, I had a conversation year a number of years ago at the combine with Fred Taylor, the former great back of the mm. Jaguars. And he talked to me about reaccelerating, and I, I've never forgotten that conversation. And Chubb is a great example of that. He can run inside and get hit and slow down, and then all of a sudden there's a burst there, and he's gone. So I think, you know, Edmonds being not in this game, and I know he's been officially ruled out, um, you know, that's a big factor. You know, Dotson is going to have to play at a really high level, particularly in the run game. And, you know, he's a big guy, Dotson. He's probably, what, Brownie, 245-ish? He's a big guy. Yeah, um, he's thick. Yeah, he's thick. But he's going to have to play really well. He's going to have to key and diagnose really well. He's going to have to react quickly. You know, because you know how it is in the run game in the NFL. You know, you take one wrong step. It all all it takes is 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 fractions. You know, fractions matter in the NFL. You take a half step that's wrong, and you set yourself up to be blocked. So he's going to be an important player in this game for the Bills defense, Dotson. Yeah, combining right. what you were saying about the Browns not being an offense that usually has a lot of explosive plays in the pass game. I know Steve always talks to you about how teams cannot pry the Bills out of their nickel defense. Yeah. But this particular week, with as much 12 personnel as the Browns play and Chubb being the focal point of their offense, I wonder if Leslie sprinkles in a little base well, defense just here and there. Then the question to me is, Who's the third linebacker? Because it, to me, it would have to be AJ Klein. Yeah, I think not, it could not, be not Bernard because yeah. essentially Bernard is 220 pounds. So you yeah. might as well play Teron Johnson, right. who's a really good run defender anyway. 
I think he's a terrific run defender given his size because essentially he plays in the box at times. Yeah. So, so to me, it shouldn't be Bernard. If you're going to go three linebackers, you know, if they line up in 12 or 13 personnel, because I think, isn't Njoku supposed to be back this week? He's questionable. He's, yeah, he's he was, impossible. He, he was asked if he's going to play, and he said, that's my plan. So he's so planning let's say to play. He plays. You're going to see 13 personnel, Brownie, as well, right. not just 12. So if you want to go three linebackers, we know A.J. Klein knows the system. He's been there. So it's not a matter of getting him up to speed. You know, so if you're going to go three linebackers, to me, it should be Klein as the third backup. Yeah, we were asking right. about him today, and they said they got materials in his hands. They had to cancel practice today, but they said we'll see where he is at the end of the week. But we had Micah Hyde on before you, and he knows A.J., and he says it wouldn't surprise me if he could be ready Sunday. So okay. yeah. Do, have we it seen, may happen. <laughs> yeah, have we seen enough of Buffalo's defense to know even how well they could play with three linebackers on there? We don't, you know, well, you don't, we don't really know. I mean, the yeah. last time the last time I remember them playing significantly with three linebackers was last year against New England. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, but isn't that about right? I don't yeah. Yeah. they don't ever right. do it. Yeah. They'll, yeah, yeah. they'll do it in short yardage and goal line right, when right, the, right. you know, right. but I mean, but yeah. yeah. But out in the field and a regular down and distance, they you can't get them out, out of that nickel defense. No, no, but but Brownie makes a good point. I mean, if, if Cleveland's gonna line up consistently in 12 and 13 personnel and try to grind the football, you know, you, you may need and, and I love Teron Johnson, you know that. I think oh, yeah. best, so do I we. think he's one of the best nickel corners in the league. But you know, at the end of the day, he's not 235 pounds. Yeah. Well, Greg. that's true. Yeah. Greg, thanks as always uh, for all the insight. Enjoy this game. You got any other games you got your eye on this week that, uh, you know, I'm actually really excited. Your list? I'm, I'm excited. You know, I don't want the Bills Mafia to get mad at me, but I'm excited this <laughs> game got moved because you know why? I like seeing players play to their, their true physical traits. So now indoors where weather is not a factor, you're going to see that happen. I'm not a big fan of, you know, rain games or snow games. I know a lot of people are, and maybe in Buffalo you guys are but I like to see the players play to their highest athletic trade. So I'm, I'm actually pretty excited about this one. I agree. I, I agree with you on that. I do like a, the, the occasional snow game, but um, the, the TV people love it. Yeah, right? I know. I mean, they, they, CBS is probably bummed that this game's getting moved out of Buffalo because they don't get the scene that they had for the Colts bills game five years ago or seven right, years right. ago. So uh, because of that, you know, the games don't get moved, but this one, it was a public safety issue rather than, Right. Rather than the team. I mean, yeah, certainly they can, getting, they can clear the field getting, off easy. Yeah. If, if you're getting six feet of snow and plus you got to clean the stadium. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. That doesn't take 10 minutes. Well, it's not a, the stadium. <laughs> it's the park. It's not even the stadium so much as the parking lots. Yeah, that yeah. too. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, yeah. there's just not enough. And plus the city is going to get hit by this. Sometimes the city does escapes it, but if, so they can use resources from other places to help them do the job of getting the stadium right. ready, but they, right. that's out of the question this time because of the way the storm hit. Yeah. All right, Greg, thanks as always. Enjoy that game and we'll catch up with you next week. All right, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks so much.